Hey there, true believers. This is Chef Jack with some more Marvel and DC comic book reviews. Uh, I know I've been falling behind on these. I've got to apologize. Lately, it's been damn hard for me to, to work on things. You know, I'm not going to make any excuses, but uh, I will say I'm trying to find a way that, is, that, that will make it easier in the future for me to complete these videos. You know the old adage about working smarter, don't work harder. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to work smarter on these. And, and with, you know, if it works, it'll help me put out more content. And all that said, let's go ahead and get to the, to, to the comic book reviews. In this video, I'll be taking a look at the following. All New Guardians of the Galaxy number 11. Batgirl number 15. Batman Beyond number 12. Blue Beetle number 13. Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps number 29. Justice League of America, number 15. Mother Panic, number 11. Star Wars, Dr. Aphra, number 12. Uncanny Avengers, number 27. Venom, number 154. Venom Verse, number 3. And X-Men Gold, number 12. The one-star books are the worst of the worst. These are the comics that we advise you not even bother reading much less actually spending your money on. X-Men Gold number 12. If there is one thing that can grind my gears when it comes to comic book writing, it's when the writer introduces a new and interesting idea, plays with it a little, and then suddenly abandons it in the middle and it never shows up again. The X-Men franchise, being as old as it is, is full of this stuff. But let's look at Mark Guggenheim, the current writer. What we've got with him is the romantic makeout session between Storm and Gambit, forgotten. The ramifications of Nightcrawler being unable to die, forgotten. The reintroduction of Pyro and Avalanche, forgotten. It's all been dropped like hot potatoes. So, you'd think that, you know, hey, look at this, we're finally getting to see some new ideas fleshed out, but no, because remember, this is Mark Guggenheim. He doesn't do this kind of thing. We know that when he tries to do this thing, it's going to be poorly written, inconsequential, half-assed, and offensive. And on top of it all, the X-Men were only in this issue during a flashback. This book is ridiculously bad. If I didn't know better, I'd think that they were joking. But like I said, this is Mark Guggenheim, so unfortunately, no, he means everything he said in this issue. The two-star comics are merely bad. There might be one or two things that keep them from being horrible, but for the most part, these aren't worth reading either. Blue Beetle number 13. I really don't know where to begin with this issue, and by that I mean this is less of an issue of Blue Beetle and more like a tacked-on final issue of Giffen and Demetrius' run on Justice League 3001 back you know, when they were doing New 52. This is so out of place and seemingly irrelevant that I've really got to wonder just what the hell the editors were thinking. I mean, seriously, what happened? Did, did Giffen and Demetrius march into the guy's office and go, we don't give a shit, we're, we, we are who we are, and we're a bigger name than you, so we're going to do this whether you want it or not. I mean, this story is just pointless as hell. It has nothing to do with the Blue Beetle, and it will have no long-term effect on the Blue Beetle either. The ending is, of that is, is perfectly true. We can see it, because once he gets back to the past, uh, uh, Jaime's first response isn't saying, let's go hunt down La Dama because eventually she's going to be Lady Sticks, but it's rather, wait a second, I've got to go get ready for my date tonight. He doesn't remember what he's been told, so the entire story is, is irrelevant. The art is okay overall, um, but this again, is it's such a pointless issue that, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Mother Panic number 11. This is a filler issue with very little actual Mother Panic in it. The thing is, I don't think it would matter if she was in the issue, because rather than the main character, what we get is the character development and some background people, the plot development for things going on under the table that nobody's really paying attention to. We also get the trite, tiresome, emotional drama that I talked about in the last review for this title. Um, alcoholism, physical abuse, unhealthy same-sex relations, uh, self-loathing. I'm seriously beginning to believe that Jody Hauser's agenda here is to convince us that every single human being on Earth is an unlikable piece of shit who can't be trusted further than what you or I could comfortably spit a Buick Regal. 
I mean, here I thought this was about a crime-busting vigilante, but what the heck do I know? I'm just the schmuck who reviews this comic. Venomverse number three. My first reaction to this book was, well, here we go again. This book literally has nothing interesting to say. Not about Venom, not about the base concept of the Venomverse, nada. The story feels like it was phoned in, or even worse, as if it was business as usual, insert tab A into slot B checkbox storytelling. The action is badly paced, badly blocked out, the entire thing feels as faked as a Chinese wire foo movie fight. The same story could have been told without the Venom suits, which makes the entire thing feel irrelevant. And as always, the only saving grace is the artwork. Um, Iban Coelho's work is superb, but ultimately Coelho is not going to be able to carry this series. The three star books are merely average. This is not to say that they're bad, but they're also not very good either. They may be bland, they may be blah, and they may be just such a mix of good and bad that neither dominates the issue. All New Guardians of the Galaxy number 11. On the one hand, I was a bit disappointed by this issue. It's a one-off that doesn't really feature any of the Guardians of the Galaxy. And while it does establish the Brotherhood of Raptors as a really creepy brainwashed force of murderous sociopaths, it also strays into the maudlin by digging into Richard Ryder's family troubles like a soap opera. On top of it all, Roland Bashi's art has never really done it for me. I mean, I get what he's going for here. I've enjoyed other similar work, but for some reason, Boshi in particular just seems to be messy. It doesn't do its job for me. I almost always give this book at least four stars, but this is twice in a row that I just couldn't bring myself to do it, and I really hope that this isn't the sign that the title is beginning a downward spiral. Batgirl number 15. So far, the Summer of Lies story arc could use some heavy-duty consistency. It jumps around from scenes of Batgirl and Nightwing thumping people while tossing around comedic one-liners to people suddenly suffering horrific deaths to what looks like the opening moves of a Batgirl-Nightwing romance with no tension breaks in between. It is absolutely jarring. Uh, the Mad Hatter is a wasted character in this. The death of Dr. Filbert comes way out of nowhere. They are obviously setting Ainsley up to be the Red Queen, but, you know, who knows? Everything might be red herring material. At this point, I'm not even sure I care anymore. If I ever did. I mean, as usual with Batgirl, Hope Larson seems to have assembled all the great ingredients necessary for a really cool story, and then has completely skipped the recipe and thus turned it into an inedible mess. Yeah, folks, you can tell I'm a chef. Tick me off. I start making food comparisons. Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps, number 29. This issue is the conclusion of the Fall of the Gods arc, and I just found it vastly underwhelming. I liked the overall story arc, but I think it would have been better if it had been compressed to two or three issues instead of dragging it out into four. Don't get me wrong, this isn't a particularly bad issue. There are places that are, it's actually pretty damn fine. Um, Sandoval's art, for example, is stellar, and despite the bombastic nature, the action never goes over the top. Um, the way John Stewart is written was absolutely brilliant, but otherwise there isn't really a lot to say. The Green Lanterns figure out who the bad guys are, they figure out what they're doing, they fight the bad guys, they curb stomp the bad guys. Issue over. It just felt like a huge pile of meh to me. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's just is what it is. Uncanny Avengers number 27. I'll be honest, action-packed showdowns are Jim Zub's specialty. I really enjoyed the fight with Graviton. It was dynamic and it was fun and it was beautifully staged and it, was, it clearly indicated that this issue was not going to be driven by the story but rather by the action. Unfortunately, something that isn't Zub's specialty is figuring out how to properly write long-established characters. I mean, why did Rogue go berserk in this issue? Supposedly, it's because Graviton is just that evil and just that powerful, but, you know, that doesn't wash. She's supposed to be the living embodiment of Xavier's dream. She was a mutant who learned to control the side effect of their powers so that she was no longer a threat to anybody. And now they're retconning her, again, for no good reason at all. So, in the end, I guess, I'll have to say that while this was a fun issue, it absolutely was not a standout issue. 
the four star books are the good stuff. They have everything you want in a comic book. There may be one or two small problems, but nothing that actually detracts from your enjoyment of the title. So these are the ones we actually recommend. Justice League of America number 15. If I were being asked to recommend a story arc of the JLA Rebirth series to start a new reader off on, it would not be this arc. That said, if I was being asked that same question by a veteran comics reader who was looking to get back into the Justice League, I might recommend this specific issue, even though it's in the middle of a story arc. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a standalone look at Ray Palmer, and it's superb. I've always been a big fan of the B-list heroes, and Ray Palmer's Autumn is, one of, the, is one, one of the best, in my opinion. And gladly, they do not seem to be trying to turn him into Brandon Routh's Adam from the Legends of Tomorrow TV series. I also want to mention Felipe Watanabe's art. Uh, he is absolutely dynamic, and he's clean, and he's vibrant. We really should be keeping an eye out for him because he may end up being one of the greats in the next 20 years. Star Wars, Dr. Aphra number 12. I'm going to start my review by being honest. This was almost a three-star issue. While I, went, I enjoyed seeing how Aphra struggled to salvage some small amount of victory out of the huge snafu that was her attempt to auction off the quote-unquote Jedi artifact, I found the rest of the story a bit underwhelming. But just a bit. Just a little bit. I was a huge fan of the, agon the, the antagonistic dynamic between Aphra and her two droids, but now that this is gone, there's a huge hole, and I don't think that Gillen can fill it well. It was worrying. Also, how the hell does a writer make Darth Vader, of all people, boring? And he's just, he, he just is. He's, he's not used very well in this book at all. Like I said, it was almost a three-star book. But in the end, it turned out that I enjoyed it more than I didn't. The five-star books are the ones that, for this review, stand head and shoulders over the others. They may not be perfect, but they're the ones that come closest to it. Batman Beyond number 12. Attention Marvel Comics. This is how you do a well-done comic book about diversity. This issue concentrates on the Batman Beyond version of Batgirl. All we know about her prior to this is that her secret identity is a teenage girl named Nyssa. And this is the first time that we have learned anything else about her motives, her reasons, her attitudes, anything really. Prior to this, she was a cipher. She was ba as background as wallpaper, and we paid just about the same amount of, of attention to her. This one-shot issue doesn't depend on gender politics or demeaning male characters to let us know that female characters can be strong and capable and independent on their own. It also lets us know that crime doesn't stop in Gotham just because Terry McGinnis is out of town. On top of it all, Dexter Vine's artwork is amazing. The colors are dynamic, they're effective, and overall, this is a solid and satisfying issue. Venom number 154. Let me start out that this issue may well be the best written Venom-oriented story in the history of the character. And I've been reading Venom-oriented stories all the way back when the symbiote was still being worn by Spider-Man. This issue accomplishes everything that the Venomverse just fails at. It makes Venom interesting again as a character. This issue's story is all about the symbiote with almost no participation from Eddie Brock at all. The narrative centers directly on the alien and how it has begun to question its own reasons for doing what it does. In this way, Costa is doing something no previous Venom writer has ever bothered to do. He's treating the suit like it's an independent character with its own goals, its own thoughts, its own feelings. In addition, Siskera's artwork is top-notch and an ideal match for the quality of this storytelling. If the editors at Marvel had a brain between them, and we know they don't, they'd keep this writer-artist team together for as long as possible. So there you have the reviews, folks. Now, on to the roundup and the tallying of the scores. This time around, DC Comics had no one-star books, two two-star books, 
two three-star books, one four-star book, and one five-star book. Awarding them one point for every star gives them a grand total of 19 points. I reviewed six titles for DC, which gives them an average score of 3.1 points. On the other hand, Marvel had one one-star book, one two-star book, two three-star books, one four-star book, and one five-star book. As with DC, awarding them a point for every star gave them a grand total of 18 points. I reviewed six titles from Marvel also, which gives them an average score of three points. That's 3.0 points. DC takes the victory, but by only a tenth of a point. This may well be the narrowest victory I've ever had in any of my videos. While it was a close call, DC did manage to pull out the win. Congratulations DC Comics once again. But you have to wonder about this close call. Is it a sign that things are getting better at Marvel, or is it a sign that things are getting worse at DC? Who knows? But what did you think, true believers? Have you read any of these books? Did you like them? Did you hate them? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, by all means, please hit that like button. I always appreciate it. Uh, you know, if you haven't bothered to subscribe, go ahead and do so. We're good guys. We make good videos. You hit that little uh, notification bell next to the subscribe button, too. That way you don't miss anything that we're doing here. Um, if you really, really like what we're doing, you want to give us a hand. We've got a Patreon page and a Vidme page all set up. They're linked below. Hop on over there. Uh, you know, drop a dollar in the till. We appreciate it greatly. Um, you know, that way you can keep the lights on and the trainer running around here. But even if you don't, thank you very, very much for watching.